Okay, I guess we'll get started. So, bienvenue. P3. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, the, everyone. For coming to the 27th event of Disrupting Disruptions, the Feminist and Accessible Publishing, Communications, and Technologies Practices Speaker and Workshop Series. I'm Dr. Alex Ketchum, and I'm a professor of Feminist and Social Justice Studies at McGill and the organizer of this series. So just a little bit about the series. We seek to bring together scholars, creators, and people in industry working at the intersections of digital humanities, computer science, feminist studies, disability studies, communication studies, LGBTQ studies, history, and critical race theory. The series brings forward critical approaches to publishing practices, communication strategies, and techniques for making research dissemination more accessible. Season two will build on the themes of the earlier series, but will also ask questions about sustainability, maintenance, right to repair, and the power of speculative futures. The series will be divided into three major themes, challenges for feminist and accessible publishing and technologies, sustaining social justice, sustainability, right to repair and maintenance, and thirdly, toolkits, workshops applying the lessons of the speaker series. Past series speakers, Suzanne Kite and Jess McLean have pointed to the physical and material impacts of the digital world. While the events this semester are virtual, Everything that we do is tied to the land and the space that we are on. Furthermore, as the series seeks to draw attention to power relations that have been invisibilized, it is important to acknowledge Canada's long colonial history and current political practices. This series is affiliated with the Institute for Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies of McGill University. We are currently located on unceded Ganyangahaga territory. Furthermore, the ongoing organizing efforts at Unistodan and elsewhere make clear the ever presence and ongoing colonial violence in Canada. Interwoven with this history of colonization is one of enslavement and racism. This university's namesake, James McGill, enslaved black and indigenous peoples. It was in part from the money he acquired through these violent acts that McGill University was founded. These histories are here with us in this space and inform the conversations that we have today. The series was made possible thanks to our many founders as funders, a special thanks to the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada, the IGSF, Milieu of Concordia, the Indigenous Futures Labs, the Intersectionality Research Hub, NILA, the Black Feminist Futures Working Group, Cinema Politica, and more. Please check out our website and social media for a list of upcoming talks. On November 4th, Meredith Broussard will be speaking, and on November 11th, Joy Lisi Rankin will be speaking. We have videos of past events and information of future events shared on our website and social media. All of our events are free to attend, open to the public, and while virtual, professionally captioned. I'd like to thank our captionist, Cassandra, who is with us today. For this event, recording is enabled so that the event can be posted on YouTube and later embedded on our website. Don't worry, only the speakers will be shown in the video. We also have a Q&A option available, so feel free throughout the entire event to type your questions into that box and we will try to um, get to them at the um, later part of the event. So now for today's event, the format's going to be a bit different. Rather than a lecture, it'll be, it'll be a fireside chat followed by a Q&A. Again, I encourage you to type your questions into the Q&A box. I now have the pleasure of introducing Yolanda Munoz, who will be introducing our fireside chatters, Alice and Elizabeth. Yolanda Munoz is a course lecturer on gender and disability at the IGSF. She is also the coordinator of the Disability Inclusive Climate Action Research Program at the McGill Faculty of Law. As a person with a physical disability, she's advocated for disability rights at the local and international level for more than 28 years. Thank you everyone for participating and thank you to Yolanda for the next set of introductions. Yolanda, you're muted right now. Excuse me. Thank you very much for, uh, for giving me the opportunity to introduce uh, briefly this event. We are uh, deeply honored today to host a conversation with, uh, with one of the most influential leaders in the promotion of disability justice and culture in the US and in the English speaking community around the world, Alice Wong. Alice Wong, whose preferred pronouns are she and her, is a disabled activist, media maker, and consultant. 
She is the founder and director of the Disability Visibility Project, or DVP for its acronym. A community partnership, which is a community partnerships, uh, partnership with Story Corps and an online community dedicated to creating, sharing, and amplifying disability media and culture, which was created in 2014. Alice is also a co-partner in four projects, that is disabledwriters.com, a resource to help editors connect with disabled writers and journalists, also hashtag creeplit, a series of Twitter chats for disabled writers with novelist Nicola Griffith. <clears throat> Another project is hashtag Crip the Vote, a nonpartisan online movement encouraging the political participation of disabled people with co partners Andrew Pulran and Greg Berrettan. And Access is Love, with co partners Mia Mingus and Sandy Ho a campaign that aims to help build a, a world where accessibility is understood as an act of love instead of a burden or an afterthought. Alice's areas of interest are popular culture, media politics, disability representation, Medicaid policies and programs, storytelling, social media, and activism. She has been published in the New York Times, Vox, Catalyst, Syndicate Network, Uncanny Magazine, Curbed SF, Eater, Pitch Media, Team Vogue, Transom, Making Contact Radio, and Rooted in Rights. Her activism and work has been featured in the CNN original series, United Shades of America, season three, episode four as well as in WBUR, Wired, The Hill, Autostraddle, Berkit, or Berkit? <laughs> I'm sorry, that was German. <laughs> the podcast, WNYC, The Guardian, uh, WANU uh, Radio, Roll Call, WBUR Radio, Al Jazeera, Team Vogue, Beach, Media, Rewire, Vice, Esquires, <laughs> it's huge. C N E T and Ball Speed. In 1997, she graduated uh, with degrees in English and Sociology from Indiana University at Indianapolis. She has a, 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 an MS in Medical Sociology and worked at the University of California, San Francisco, as a staff research associate for over 10 years. During that time, she worked on various qualitative research projects and co-authored online curricula for the Community Living Policy Center, a rehabilitation research and training center funded by the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research. Uh, recognized for her service to the community and activism at the local and national level, Alice received the Beacon Award by the San Francisco Mayor's Disability Council in 2010 and the Disability Award by the I University of California, San Francisco in 2011. From 2013 to 2015, Alice served as a member of the National Council on Disability, an appointment by President Barack Obama. Alice is the recipient of the 2016 AAPD Paul G. Hearn Leadership Award, an award for emerging leaders with disabilities who exemplify leadership, advocacy, and dedication to the broader cross-disability community. Recently, Alice <coughs> launched the Disability Visibility, Disability Visibility Podcast in September uh, 2017, and published Resistance and Hope, Essays by Disabled People in October 2018. In 2018, Alice was featured in the Beach 50, Alice recognizing the most impactful creators, artists, and uh, activists in pop culture, uh, influential feminists by Beach Media and Color Lines 20, uh, 20x20, 
a group of transformative leaders reimagining what it means to advance racial justice. In 2020, Alice was named by Time Magazine as one of the 16 people fighting for equality in America. Alice published an editor uh, hashtag ADA30 in color, which is a series of essays by disabled people of color in July. Alice was featured in multiple, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Alice was featured with multiple activists on the cover of British Box September issue. For the Pop Culture Collaborative, she guest edited Break the Story Volume 4, Disability Visibility, a snapshot of disability culture. Along with 19 other disabled artists, Alice was named Disability Futures Fellow, a grant by the Ford Foundation and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Currently, Alice is the editor of Disability Visibility, the, uh, the first person stories from the 21st century, an anthology of essays by disabled people available now by Vintage Books and published in uh, 2020. Uh, uh, she also works as an independent research consultant as part of her uh, side hustle. Uh, her work is crucial in a moment where social justice movements seem to be working in silos and do not take into consideration that disability is present in every social setting. The work of Alice Wong represents an outstanding contribution to advance meaningful inclusion, and her leadership encourages people with disabilities to be proactive and ensure that disability will be a priority in the struggle against all forms of discrimination. In reference to the book she edited this year, W. Kamau Bell, host of United Shades of America rightly describes the significance of her endeavors. And I quote, to Alice Wong, words like diversity and intersectionality aren't just those words. They are marching orders. Everyone should take in the wisdom moving throughout this book. And well, the conversation today will be facilitated by Elizabeth Patitzas. Uh, uh, Elizabeth Patitzas is an assistant professor specializing in the sociology of computer science education. She is appointed 50 50 with the School of Computer Science and the Department of Integrated Studies in Education. Professor Patitzas is the principal investigator in the social studies of, uh, of computing lab. She identifies as a disabled queer scholar and is particularly interested in computer sciences education. She teaches uh, critical disability studies for education and computer science audiences. Alice, Elizabeth, thank you very much for being with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you, Yolanda. Oh, go ahead, Alice. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for that kind introduction. And it was a bit long, so I apologize if my bio was very tedious. So that's just, I just want to put that out there. All right. So, Alice, um, I guess we'll, we'll start with the book because Yolanda was just talking about it. Um, I thought it was amazing. I'm just going to put that forward. Um, it, it made me feel lots of emotions from happy to, oh my god. Um, so I think the first question coming to mind for me is, you know, you as an editor, um, how, there were some, you know, stories in here that were pretty, like, heavy. Right. There, there were some, you know, and one of the things I really liked about the book was the content warnings as appropriate on chapters. But there's there's some really serious stuff. And how, as an editor, um, were you able to deal with, with editing such serious, heavy, triggering material? Uh, yeah, thanks for asking me. And I'm just delighted to be in conversation with you because 
I am curious about your take and, you know, the fact that this book was really created for us and by us. So that to me was like the goal, you know, to really please disabled readers and, you know, just anyone from our communities. And, uh, you know, that to me was the whole purpose. It was it's really to pander to this larger audience. I think uh, non-disabled people are clearly welcomed in, uh, as I write in my introduction, but I think it's also trying to decenter both kind of books that are, you know, for a general audience, because I think we should question why, what are assumptions about an audience, you know, what an audience wants or expects, especially about disability, right? I think this is, you know, one of many books that are trying to, you know, kind of turn the tables and really uh, celebrate us as a culture. Uh, yeah, so there were a, a lot of serious pieces interspersed, I think, with a lot of other pieces that are much more joyous, celebratory. There's a lot of just like people just living their lives. And I think that's really important. You know, people just, they maybe talk about disability, but that's not all of them are talking about disability. They're just talking about their careers or their passions or their work. And I think that's, you know, and their interests, you know, what they care about. I think that to me is really important more than these kind of basic, like, this is what it's like, or, uh, you know, more of a disability 101, because I think we've seen that already, you know. I think it's, you know, I think it's really overdue for a little bit deeper and a little bit more challenging work. You know, that's very much, I think, a reflection of issues that I think are super important for us as a community, but also the broader community to really understand kind of the history of, for example, eugenics, uh, ableism, racism, white supremacy, you know, a settler colonialism. And I think that's to be uh, part of the goal is to really give people as much substance in a very small book, which is, you know, not meant to be, it's not meant to be an encyclopedic. You know, it's it's not an agency. It doesn't, it doesn't, you know, represent every single disability community or category. It's really just, a collection of 37 people to all have very powerful personal and political stories. So I think that's the through line. If there is a through line, is that each person really makes the personal political. And that was really the goal. And I think that's, you know, we're, much, we're so complicated. We're so varied. We're so diverse. And I think we're not easily you know, we can't just be described with it, you know, two or three sentences. And I think that's part of the beauty. Yeah. One of the things I loved about the introduction was how you framed this about this isn't Disability 101. Um, you know, this this is just, as you were just putting it, like for disabled people, by disabled people. And if you're not, if you're new to this, then, you know, take this as an opportunity to like feel out of place and, you know, mm. motivation to try and, you know, go look up this disability one-on-one -on -one stuff, but that isn't the purpose of this book. Um, and when I read that, I, I literally like squeed aloud. I was like, Yee! Um, because we don't get that a lot in, in like mass market paperback type books. And I was wondering, did you get, pushback from publishers about that sort of framing? Luckily, I did it, and I think, you know, the trick of writing this introduction, you know, I had to kind of do several things, you know, really wrestled with it, and I thought, okay, you know, this is going to be my only uh, shot at publishing something by a major publisher. I'm just going to put it all out there, 
So I just went for it, you know, and uh, yes, you know, with this opportunity, well, yeah, but yeah, so this introduction for those that in the audience who have not read it yet, it's partially my personal story, kind of how I got to this moment, and really about how community has really led me here. You know, it's been to find the community and to be part of a community that's brought me to this place. The other part is, you know, to give you a brief overview of the book, the way it's laid out, my thinking behind the different sections, there are four sections, to explain a content warnings, and the fact that there is a resource list in the back, you know, I think uh, <clears throat> I wanted this book to be a springboard for people to learn more. And clearly, you know, this is just one anthology. So I, you know, created a list of reading lists and a list of other resources because I really want to leave readers excited and curious and, you know, hungry for more. So I really hope that they take advantage of this reading list because the list contains a lot of essays and other books that I wish I could have incorporated into this anthology, but that's that's not realistic. Uh, the other part of the introduction was really more of a manifesto, as you as you mentioned. You know, this is all about being explicit about my intentions of this book, my hopes for this book, but also, you know, kind of sparking people to reflect and have, and to be challenged, to have conversations, you know, to think about like, why don't we have more work by disabled people? Why don't publishers have more disabled editors? You know, and also why do we always presume that the audience, you know, we, I think so, even with public, popular culture, we kind of underestimate what audiences want. And what audiences expect. And I really think that there's, you know, so much more that people want. You know, I think especially now with, you know, so many decades of people pushing for more diversity, you know, across the board. I think it's a perfect time because it's, you know, people are really fed up. They're not waiting around for Hollywood or, you know, Bay Street Media. They're creating their own work. So this is a wonderful time to really push at the edges and to really kind of call for accountability. So that was kind of all of the things I kind of put into the introduction. Yeah. Um, as was just introduced about this speaker series, one of the themes is accessible publishing and communication. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts about how we could help make books more accessible. Yeah, thank you for asking that because that was definitely a concern of mine. You know, when I got this book deal, you know, I felt this overwhelming this is a privilege, you know, clearly this is not very, it's still not as rare, it's kind of rare still, and, you know, that's kind of heavy on my mind about my own responsibility, and I also thought about, you know, clearly not everybody can afford a book, and uh, gosh, you know, like, what can I do to make sure is it different forms and just different ways to reach people with this? So, you know, uh, one thing I did was it the uh, as the book was you know almost near completion, uh, I hired two disabled writers. I commissioned them to create two free resources that are on my website, so people can find it at disability visibilityproject.com slash book. 
So this page has all of the information about my book, but it also has a free discussion guide for teachers, readers, book clubs by Naomi Ortiz, who is a disabled writer. There's also a plain language version of the book by Sarah Lutman, who is an autistic writer and reporter. And I think um, the plain language version was definitely one way to open up the book to different audiences, because, you know, the pieces in this anthology really vary. It is a style, like, like which, yeah. and some pieces are a lot more dense than others. So I really wanted a plain language version that's free, that can be accessed by anyone. And I think, you know, one thing that I've learned from people with intellectual developmental disabilities is that plain language is a major, you know, access issue. And we still don't think of that as what we think of access. You know, we think about captioning, we think about curve guides, we think about ASL interpreters, sign language interpreters. You know, but we don't think about people with invisible disabilities, especially cognitive and learning. And I think that's, again, you know, just something that I've learned and observed and try to put into practice. So those are things I try to do and, you know, uh, also content warnings. So, you know, it's also, I think, I don't think I've seen that many books with content warnings like this. I think I've seen some academic texts, but not you know, these kind of uh, general audience kind of things. And to me, that was really another form of access, right? People experience trauma. People have PTSD. You know, there's a lot of things that are really serious and disturbing. And readers should have a heads up and they can protect themselves and choose to, to read it or not. You know, I don't expect people to read every single piece, but it's there if they want it. And also, um, it takes nothing away from the book. You know, I think there's a lot of, you know, ch chatter, you know, about, oh, content warnings, you know, this is so PC. It just, you know, a lot of students are just you know, saying, no, it's not, you know, just, I've seen conversations between, like, you know, faculty and just, like, a little bit of tension, right, between teachers and students. And I think it doesn't take anything away from the content. It just adds to it. And I think this is absolutely the future in terms of just ways we can really be thoughtful and mindful in our work. Yeah. And also, well, I guess I would just add one more thing. Since I am speaking at a, two folks at a university, you know, I didn't include really any scholarly work because, you know, clearly as a former academic, I think, let's face it, there's a lot of work, is even into like, let's say feminist studies, disability studies, science and technology studies. My goodness, like, even, I'll read something where I think the title sounds super interesting, the abstract sounds interesting, but once I read the article, I'm just like, I don't get it. I have no idea what they're talking about. And I'm like, and I, here I am someone who does have some sort of background you know, in social sciences, and, you know, I'm just like, what are they talking about? So that to me is, I think, an issue too, that I think there's so much important knowledge to be created by scholars, but it's so out of reach to the communities that they're writing about. Oh, I agree totally. Yeah, and I feel like this is, 
a long way to go, and I think not to add to another responsibility, but I do think that scholars should practice plain language writing because, you know, while there are within academic, you know, within academia pressures, right, to be writing a certain style, to be taken seriously, right, there's all these kind of within institutional tensions and pressures. But I do think that there is a question about, like, what is the point of creating all this work if people are going to be able to access it? And I feel that way about a lot of books in disability studies where there's a lot of great things to share, but it's not in a format that really reaches a wide audience. And I think people should care about that. I think it's, it's not something frivolous or a waste of time to think about it. So, before, and I do have one piece by Ella Samuels on Krypton that is from the Disability Studies Quarterly. But this piece is not a journal article. This was a personal essay. But really, uh, it really captures a lot of her scholarly work, but in a very kind of approachable format. So that to me was my way of capturing a little bit of disability studies, but you know, I was pretty deliberate in not really choosing a lot of this academic work because, you know, in a lot of ways, there's a there's a this, there's more work that needs to be done. What are your thoughts about that, Elizabeth? Um, okay, so a minute ago, you might have seen me just like, you know, <laughs> jump back when you said you didn't include any scholarship in this book. And um, I, and, I mean, I can't speak for every academic, but one of the things that I very much push back on is this idea that the only form of scholarship is the stuff that happens in yes. peer-reviewed journals. To me, everything in this book is scholarship. Uh, but, but I think that's, uh, I think that's still not the pervasive view, though. I agree with you. That is it's not the like, pervasive yeah, view. Yes. And so for my fellow academics who are in the audience, like one of the things that I would you know, add to Alice's challenge to you to you know, write accessibly, but also to think about treating accessible work as scholarship mm -hmm. like don't only cite peer-reviewed articles also cite uh blog posts cite podcasts cite twitter conversations like there's so much careful deliberative you know dialogue and thought that is going on in these so-called mm -hmm. informal spaces mm -hmm. that never makes it into peer-reviewed publications and if you only look at peer-reviewed publications, you're missing, you're missing the conversation. Yeah, and you don't need theory to be a scholar. You know, like, I mean, it's just that I do see all of this work as artistic, scholarly work, but I think, you know, when I mentioned that, it's really more about, like, what is commonly viewed. Yeah. Because I think that, you know, there might be people, like, in disability studies, I think, oh my gosh, like, you know, where is the academic stuff? I think, you know, I just wanted to bring up Alice Samuel's piece because it's probably the closest, you know, approximation, but I think, yeah, there's this, like, yeah, but I agree with you. Yeah, and, and I think rethinking what scholarship means is an important part of CRIP uh cripping the university and revisioning uh the university um on the note of education uh you you know some minutes ago we're talking about resources for teachers and um in preparation for this discussion i asked a bunch of my students you know what what questions do you have for alice wong oh. uh, so one of the questions i received which was from eric mayhew and amanda triassi which 
they are they are education um, alumni and you know work in our K to twelve school system. Uh, they ask, as a teacher, how can we create classroom cultures that move beyond tolerating disabled people and move towards fostering and celebrating disabled identities in and outside the classroom? Uh, thank you, Eric, Rebecca. Was that better? Yeah, thank you, Eric, Rebecca, for this question. And you know, I wish I had a pity, you know, recommendation. But I would think that I think uh, one way to start is not thinking about disabled students as, you know, something that's seen as a burden in terms of just having to accommodate disabled students as a way of like, some, I've seen, you know, some teachers talk about, I have to give so much more time it put it more effort and more work to, to make sure that disabled students is accommodated and that takes away from the entire classroom. And I would just probably want to, I know that every teacher thinks that way, but I do think that there is something about bringing in the entire classroom to think about access generally and not putting the disabled students, you know, on the, sp in the, sp on the spot. You know, I think uh, a lot of my own experiences as, for most of my elementary experience, pretty much I was only, I was, oh, chat cameo. Uh, I was the only wheelchair using disabled students in all of my classrooms. And I think, you know, there were so many things that, I wasn't included in or just put on the sideline and as a kind of afterthought. And I think, you know, there's so many creative ways to think about how do we bring everybody in without making that student feel like, you know, so like, you know, under the spotlight. So I think this is a call for teachers to really be creative and think about like, Maybe there's different ways to, to reconfigure the room or maybe reconfigure the way we structure lessons and talk about things that's, you know, are subtly much more accessible without having to say, oh, this is for this student. You know, I think there's a lot of ways to build it to access and inclusion that doesn't have to be specifically for one or several students. I think that's really important. And I think it's a it's an opportunity to really think more kind of creatively and uh, be a little more innovative. And I know that the teachers have so many things that they have to do. And there's so much limited capacity. But I do think that those kinds of approaches, you know, just try to be a little bit more effective to really serve all of your students well. Because I think even the students that they or may not have, you know, accommodations or access needs, they can really use them. And um, they be what they may need them anyway. So, you know, these are all good things to keep in mind. And I hope that answered your question. Yeah, uh, I and mean, maybe we'll hear for more from um, Eric and Amanda. One one thing coming to mind that you know I would add on for teachers in the audience is thinking about how you can talk about disability and make that part of your curriculum, mm -hmm. because disability touches on everything, and just like right now, you know the standard in our culture is to not talk about disability, to hide it, make it invisible. And so for disabled students, it, it's hard for them to know about disabled history, about disabled mm -hmm. culture, about the contributions that disabled people have made. Mm -hmm. um, and in my own teaching, like I'll teach, you know, introductory computer science and I'll talk about Braille 
for instance, is like one of the first standard uses of, you know, a binary encoding system, which was created by a blind, you know, student for his own, you know, purposes. And it, it's often just like these one-off statements that take seconds of your time as a teacher, but make such a difference for students who may not feel like the classroom is a place for them. Yeah, I feel like this is uh, so similar to just the process of decolonization, you know, this idea of what are we teaching, what's in our curricula, what's in our history, what's on our bookshelves, you know, I think so many of these things that we think of as the standards really are through this white, you know, cis, patriarchal less and it's uh, very much you know thought disabled as well you know kids are just so open-minded and just you know are eager to learn about different things and i think educators have such an influence i do think that especially for younger students you know there is a great body of uh, children's literature YA literature that's really focused on like disabled characters and by disabled people. I think much more so than for adult readers. Adults, you know, quote, quote, adult fiction, even though YA really is for everyone. Um, but I do think that, you know, teachers can easily incorporate, you know, disabled history, disability culture, you know, for example, um, you know, doing something about accessibility, right? Like just, you know, projects like look around your town. What do you see? You know, what are, or have guest speakers from the disability community, right? Just different ways to highlight that disability is everywhere and that it's not something to be feared. I mean, there are disabled teachers, there are disabled parents who might be just, you know, already part of their communities that we just that most students don't know about and i think also just visually like just to what you bring into the classroom to what you choose to share with the classroom can go a long way and you know for example there's you know the documentary trip camp which is on netflix now and uh, you know this is from i think a lot of people a great kind of entry point into kind of American disability history. It's just one of many stories, but it is widely available. It's just a great way to get people kind of, oh, did I know about this? Or, oh, just, so I think there's a, just more content now that's exciting to me. And I do hope, you know, this anthology will be part of a lot of syllabi because that was also my other kind of hidden agenda that's not only is it something that's fun to read and that's for us by us but it will be also in a lot of curricula just i think it fits with it cultural studies women's studies gender studies you know so many different kinds of disciplines so i hope it works across the board it could be used as another entry point yeah i am um, so some of the essays in this book had been previously published elsewhere and uh just so you know alice two of the essays in this book i use in my teaching <laughs> yeah. yay um right so one of the things we're we're starting to get on talking about is identity as as disabled people and one thing I wanted to talk about is, so I, you know, see disability very broadly because I'm, you know, proudly disabled and I think it's a good thing and, you know, proud of my di disabled identity. Um, but I know a lot of people in my life who, you know, I would easily call them disabled, but for various reasons, they don't think of themselves that way. They may not have connected the dots. They think that they're the problem and they haven't, you know, seen 
ableism as ableism as opposed to something's wrong with them or they question that they're not disabled enough because they're not a white man in a wheelchair right and what do you say do you do you have any advice on like what would you say to these people there might be people in our audience right now who fit the exact just a description i described yeah i think i would say that there's no kind of one trajectory or one process and you don't have to trade identity or be proud to be part of the community you know i think that's really important that we're much more open and just welcoming of people that if they don't want to say the word disabled like that's okay like i still think of you as part of the community whether you choose a different term or maybe not use any term or not i think there's a, a lot of kind of inner inner community stuff that needs to be done too right and there's a lot of gatekeeping and there's a lot of kind of people who just say like you have to feel this way about yourself and i don't think you know everybody's gonna get to a point on their own you know everybody's gonna be have to work through stuff whether you're born disabled or become disabled the later on in life it's just it's a lot to work through and i think that there should be there should be more less judgments and more flexibility and fluidity uh, who gets to be part of the community i mean i'm much more kind of open like just people can enter and exit right just it's nice there's no membership card you know there's no dues like, you don't have to like you don't have to flash a badge to be you know part of the community there's really just no one community to begin with like there's there's so many communities that you can be a part of and i think that's really important that people just it is scary like you know even i i think when i grew up i just had so much internalized stuff that i had to work through just to feel confident and i think for me community did lead me to become more politicized and become politicized really cemented by identity and not everybody wants to be politicized i think that's you know that's what freedom is all about you know just there's a lot of people just will never to be interested in that and that, that's okay too i think that's you know that's going to be expected and um, i also feel like not everybody has to be an activist you know we live in a not disabled world and i think the goal for in my mind one day in the future is that disabled people whether they identify or not they don't have to work so hard to, to advocate for themselves like they can just be i mean one day we're gonna get there but it really still has to always be that we still have so much emotional labor and very real labor that we perform all the time just to exist just to get our needs met so everybody's dealing with their own kind of things going on a lot of things going on so i just hope that people find comfort find support wherever they can find it to use language that they fits them and also doing that these things evolve people evolve you know the b 10 years ago but it's, it's very different and i think I'm, as i've gotten older i've definitely become much more radical and you know more like you know i don't give a bleep you know anymore much more now than i was uh, 20 years old but i was much more like timid like i think you know, in the 20s, I would have never even used the word activist to describe myself. It took me a while to be more comfortable. And I think that's very similar to people who want, you know, are thinking about disability identity. And 
you know, again, uh, this could be a very slow, evolving, recursive process. It's not linear. And I do hope that people just uh, end up just finding a space where they feel seen and heard. That's me. Is the most important, whether it's the disability community or other communities that are part of. I think that's that's what we all kind of want to see. So, yeah, I have a much more kind of to realize kind of attitude toward that. Cool. Um, so I mentioned I you know asked students of mine if they had questions for you, and one of my students. Anna Ma, who is in my uh, lab and also took my disability studies class last year, um, has multiple questions for you. So Anna, I, I, I'm giving you the stage. Hi, oh my gosh. I just want to first thank you so much for agreeing to do this event. Um, I know I was really excited when Elizabeth told me this event was being organized. So um, yeah, I'm really, thrilled to be able to ask you a question. Um, so my, I have a couple of questions as Elizabeth said, but my first question um, is that I was hoping to hear from you as a fellow disabled Chinese American about if you had any insights or suggestions for how disabled Asian Americans, especially those with invisible disabilities like mental health issues, can bridge the cultural differences that often emerge when discussing disability in the Asian community. I really enjoyed reading your essay in Amer Asia, where you went into detail about the intersections in your identity as a disabled Chinese American. And I want to acknowledge the point you've made before that the Asian community is diverse and no more a monolith than a disabled community is one. However, to paraphrase you, it's also unsaid among some Asian Americans about the cultural tendency to exclude those who are disabled and regard disability with shame in general. So I was just wondering if you had any culturally spe specific advice for young disabled Asian Americans who struggle to openly acknowledge or discuss their disability amidst a cultural background that generally view views disability disfavorably. Um, thank you, Anna. And I was just like, it's always fun to connect with us. The other Asian American disabled people, yay! <laughs> so, you know, again, shout out to the Asian Canadians as well. Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't want to just root it on us at, this, at the US. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it is super complicated. I think uh, the essay is a book by Sandy Ho, mm -hmm. it does a really wonderful job. I think also you know, teasing out these nuances and tensions about even the language about disability mm -hmm. within Asian cultures. You know, there are so many different ways of thinking about disability that are so outside of the Eurocentric or North American, you know, conception, right? And I think there's also something to be learned from those things, right? Like this, maybe it's not all negative. Maybe there's things that we can learn from cultures in the global south that think about disability. That's may not be like the same thing that we were, you know, thinking about like now within this, you know, in this kind of current space. But there's probably you know some insight, you know, and I think that's important too that we just. Uh, don't always try to cast it as negative, shameful, and taboo, even though clearly there are those threads within various Asian cultures. You know, uh, it's still a struggle for me, I think, uh, to be totally honest. Uh, there are limits for me in terms of how hard I try with my parents and family about talking about disability, talking about, you know, Chinese American attitudes, because I think I have been traumatized, to be honest, mm -hmm. by comments and, uh, you know, stereotypes and just assumptions. Mm -hmm. And for me, you know, 
So what's been really helpful is doing the app dot load at this. So it is your dot load, app dot load. To me, it says we're out there, even though sometimes I feel like it's still hard to find other disabled people of color mm-hmm. who they have similar experiences. So for me, the strength that I get is knowing that we are not alone and that sometimes, just speaking for myself, you know, I do debate, I do argue, I do try with my parents and relatives, but a lot of times I'm just like, you know what, like there's, this is a good use of my time. You know, to be honest, right? Like, right. Uh, you know, is it, do I need, do, do I really need their understanding? Mm-hmm. You know, maybe if they uh, get a little bit of the understanding, but maybe by expectation, maybe I should adjust it as well because I could get that affirmation to also in other places too. So I think and that's something that you know, has been a part of a long process. Like, you know, I was really frustrated as a teenager, a young adult, I'm feeling very isolated as the only disabled child within this, you know, Chinese American family. And really just annoyed by like uncles and aunties and cousins and, you know, all that stuff. But, um, you know, when I got older, it's just like, a little more mature and a little more like I still relate to wanting to be needed to the need to, to be understood or accepted but I do feel like nowadays it's a lot less and I feel like because I feel much more connected now to other people to especially other Asian disabled people were like I have that already so it also giving people grace to, to understand that they have their own perspectives their own limitations like I have my limitations too in terms of what I perceive and what I understand so I've also tried to not get a you know force people to like to see me the way I, you know that, you know kind of try to, to force me that they not be realistic so I don't know if that's helpful at all but just to know that you're not alone with this no that that was actually really helpful um I think to especially hear from you that this is a difficult subject and that there are no easy answers. Um, I guess for a while I thought maybe I was like missing something in my communication with uh, my parents and relatives. So um, yeah. like, I'm sorry, please continue. Oh no, yeah, I think it's it's great that you're trying. I think that's really important. And I think, uh, you know, there is a point, I think for some of my friends who just, you know, kind of like, it's harmful, you know, it becomes maybe too much on you in terms of like all the work that you're doing to kind of to bridge those understandings. And, mm-hmm. you know, there are times when you can have a chosen family. Right. You'll really be there for you. And I think that doesn't mean that you're your immediate biological nuclear family isn't there for you, but you can also you know, feel supported. So I think, you know, I don't know if, got to, if, if I'll ever get to that place, but I think, you know, just like a lot of other communities, to when people come out, when people are, you know, do and they want, to, they, they're trying to share who they really are mm-hmm. to their families. Sometimes there is a point where, you know, I've done the work, I've done enough, and maybe this is, you know, where we're going to leave things. So just take care of yourself, 
you know, try to take care of yourself. And don't feel like it's constantly just something that you have to do. Right. Wow. Yeah. Um, I think, like you said, it's it's just really nice to have these types of feelings validated and to know that you're not alone. So, yeah. Thank you for thank you for saying all of that. That that was actually truly helpful. Um, I blessed it. I do have a podcast episode up from a year or two ago on Asian American mental health Mm -hmm. with two Asian American women. So uh, do look that up if that's useful at all. So that's on my website. There's a podcast tab at the top of my page. You can see uh, the podcast with Asian American women talking about mental health. Definitely. I will definitely check that out. Um, Great. <laughs> I, I have one more question for you, um, if you don't mind. It kind of uh, segues nicely from um, your point of making sure to take care of yourself. Um, so I'm, I'm actually um, from the States myself originally, and um, I'm sure like many people, I mean, not including just Americans, um, we're all really concerned about the upcoming election. Um, So I was wondering if um, you had any thoughts or advice again on like how disabled people can specifically cope or like protect themselves in case of a Trump reelection, especially just given the the circumstances of the ongoing pandemic we're facing where the stakes are higher than ever. Um, I feel like I'm just like seeking out ways right now that I could prepare to fortify myself um, just in case Trump wins because I don't trust polls anymore after four years ago. I know, me too. (laughs) I'm right with you, Anna. Uh, I am full of dread. I mean, I'm just so full of dread. I just, I mean, this is a real existential threat that people of so many marginalized communities in the United States are feeling, and I'm sure, you know, Canada is not uh, without anti-indigenous, anti-blackness, just, you know, this is a moment, this is a reckoning for a lot of countries now, especially with the pandemic really being explicit about who really matters and who's seen as disposable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is really across so many countries and cultures, but clearly in the United States, it's quite blighted. Um, I do think that I return to like some of the principles of disability justice that really give me some comfort in us. So like, you know, this idea that we are interdependent and that many of us are surrounded by people that we, you know, that we're not these individual silos, you know, that there are people that are there for us and that we are there for them. I think one of the most uh, amazing things to see this year and in the last few years is seeing all the mutual aid that's popping up around the United States. So I think that people are preparing and people are supporting one another in various networks. And I think we all have, even though we're all overstated, we do have some capacity to do really show up for others. And that gives me a little solace, you know, that's, you know, even before 2016, you know, marginalized communities never felt safe, never thought the state was going to serve them or save them. So this is part of, you know, decades and centuries of surviving and thriving in hostile environments. So while this is becoming much more hostile, blatantly, uh, 
you know, I do think that there's something to be said for the community care that already does exist. You know, I do hope that you have friends and people that you can just like talk to, just like I, you know, what gives me kind of life is uh, sometimes I do have people I just like get like in group chats, just like, you know, blah, and I just I just let loose. Right. You know, I just be myself, I just be scared, can't be angry with. And that, that keeps me going, you know, also, I don't know about you, but I, you know, I'm all about just enjoy, like, to get as much pleasure, to enjoy, to get everyday things as much as possible. So, you know, yeah, videos give me life. Donuts give me life. A good cup of coffee gives me life. So, you know, I think uh, I try to find joy and try to find uh, places where there isn't, it's, it's just places where you can find pleasure. It's really important. So, I hope that helps. No, that that definitely helps. Um, I think it's it's very easy to be consumed um, by like what you said, the existential dread, because it isn't Trump's possibility of Trump's re-election is an existential threat. So, um, mm. I think it's yeah, it's it's definitely important to remind ourselves to take solace in the the the, the, the everyday pleasures. Yeah, and I think no matter what happens. Yeah, you know, people are always gonna you know, organize, mm -hmm. get mobilized in response to fascism, get in response to autocracy. I think it's you know, it's gonna be exhausting, it's but it's not the end or beginning, it's just a continuation. And while that is hard, the fact that we still have to keep pushing, I know that there's you know, a lot of people power. You know, people power is always going to rise up. They had that, you know, hopefully the future we're going to build, to build and imagine a future that's better. Um, awesome. I just, oh, go oh, ahead, Alex. Sorry. Oh, Elizabeth, I just, and maybe you're about to do this, but I just wanted to remind um, people that are attending to please write questions in the Q&A box. So we'll have about 10, 15 minutes to answer those. Um, because we have to definitely wrap up before 8.30 to be aware of the time, so thank you. Yeah, that was just what I was going to uh, invite people to do. So uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, the Q&A button is at the bottom of Zoom, uh, like where the, in the middle where, say, participants and closed mm -hmm. captions are, mm -hmm. and we'll open a little thing, and you can type in mm -hmm. some questions. So. Also, so, go ahead, Alice. Oh, okay. If we're waiting for questions, I'm, I'm curious about you, Elizabeth, in terms of this. Were there certain essays in the book that you thought that they were due to you or surprising? Um, yeah, um, so, you know, as someone who reads a lot of disability studies and hangs out on disability, disability Twitter, like, I've heard a lot of, like, I don't know, terrible experiences and um you know just when i feel like i'm starting to feel like i've seen or heard it all i discover that i have not and um the essay on incontinence was just yeah. that that one was, was eye-opening for me and yeah I, I would say that was that's the one that has been the most memorable for me out, out of the whole book. Yes, it is. Uh, the writer, Barry Bob Sopic, is, uh, is a Canadian. So uh, I would definitely encourage you to fight Barry for a future talk because I think when I read Barry's piece, you know, it just, I loved it so much because. I don't think many people talk about incontinence. Barry really 
to be their real with their own personal experiences, they don't resonate with me with my own childhood experiences. And I thought it was just so important because so many of these things that happen to us as disabled people, there are often times we don't talk about them because it puts us, sometimes it makes us feel more vulnerable and open to judgment. But I also think that when people are ready to tell these stories, it just opens up a new world where disabled people are like, oh my gosh, thank you for this. Because, you know, we still think uh, we're the only ones privately going through these things, or feeling these things. And even if you don't directly relate to it, you can just also be kind of in solidarity with the type of feelings and challenges and experiences. And I think this is why, you know, we need more stories. I think, yeah. you know, we're at a better place now than five years ago, than two years ago. But we have so much more to do. And I think there's still a huge disparity in terms of our representation across the board, you know, at universities, at every industry, you know, with the media and uh, popular culture, but I do think that's, you know, we need like a hundred more stories like Boris. And this is one that I really liked as well. I just, you know, it just, it just struck me as something I really wanted to put in there because it really kind of takes away the shape. I think that's really important. And I was just, just so grateful that Bari was willing to be part of this book. This leads really nicely into our question from Meva, who asks, I know the Disability Visibility Project is larger than the book. How did you choose what would be included? Yeah, this is a great question. Thank you. Uh, so, you know, there was, you know, a certain kind of worked out. So clearly, I could get everything in. Uh, in preparation for the book, I had a spreadsheet, so I had a spreadsheet with a lot of stories that I bookmarked over the years. You know, I'm just kind of a fan at the heart of what I do. You know, I, I see things, I read things, I'm just like, this is excellent, this is excellent, this, I love it, and uh, then, I, then I'll save it, you know, I'll save it as a reference, I'll save it as something I just share with other people are saying, why is it there? It's my seed. And I'll be like, oh, I think there is something. And I'll share it. And that makes me, that makes me, it gives me joy. Uh, so, because the book was kind of, kind of framed as 21st story, stories for the 21st century, I really wanted kind of the most current work, current stories, as a snapshot of these times. So that was one kind of factor of all. But also, I wanted just the stories that eliminate issues that are important to me. And I think well, I didn't write these stories, they are a reflection of the issues that I think that people need to understand. For example, you know, there's an essay about by the Harriet Bit. There's a Tumblr post by the Harriet Tumblr Collective about Black Lives Matter. And the uh, you know the vision to for Black Lives that must include the black disabled people, but that was written in 2016, and it's even more important today than ever. And that was one that I just, you know, that was an absolute must for me. So a lot of these works are really just reflections of issues, politics, topics that I think 
disabled and non-disabled people to really need to think about more deeply. There's a piece in there by Carol and Jarek, who was talking about B2 and rape culture and sexual assault. And I thought Ooh. she does a really good job, but also it is a difficult read, but it's also so important for disabled people to really be part of this push against sexual violence and rape culture and patriarchy. So these are all kinds of different ways of inserting ourselves and centering ourselves. So those are just different ways that were at the back of my mind in selected these pieces. And you know, I wanted a bunch of different pieces. I just didn't want to think about categories too much. I didn't worry about having a checklist. You know, these were things that I think were varied and diverse and nuanced and complicated. Like this, a lot of these stories don't have easy answers and they don't have like a wrapped up ending or, or even a happy ending, but yeah. I think they leave people, you know, thinking more. I think that's to me what really was at the heart of these stories. That hopefully they leave the reader thinking a little bit more deeply. And I hope that answered your question. <laughs> All right. So, um, we're, we're running out of time, and I'm now going to ask you a question about slowness. <laughs> um, so mm -hmm. Ash asks if you could share your thoughts on slowness, um, talking about how slowness is important to advancing accessibility, and like, but also realizing that it can promote slow violence in other forms of discrimination. So are there some ways that we need to be more critical of slowness? Wow, interesting. I think uh, slowness is wonderful. I think slowness is a form of resistance. I think especially in this pandemic, you know, time is, time is not what it was. I think that's wonderful. You know, I think it's time to really talk. I think it's a, I think it's a really good moment to do reconfigure time. You know, how do we make time work for us? How do we make time more fluid, less rigid for all kinds of body minds? You know, people have to teach, people have to learn, people have to work, people have to socialize now in new ways. And I think, you know, the technology just also just the way things have been more chaotic calls for a slowing down. I think that's really important in terms of sustainability. Just like I was, uh, in the beginning of this uh, event, talking about the importance of sustainability. It's really, I think, uh, slowness to be a really good thing. I don't know if, it, if, it's, if it needs to be critiqued, but I do think that's the reason why slowness has been kind of not supported is because of capitalism, right? That, you know, we feel like capitalism forces, it forces normalcy, and it forces a particular sense of time and peace that we're expected to follow. And those who refuse to follow it or cannot follow it are seen as lazy. I feel like slowness has this, a lot of ableist connotations of laziness that we also need to unpack because I don't think it's necessarily slowness doesn't be laziness. And I think slowness it could be a lot of things. It could be 
to be more thoughtful, be more careful, to be more protective, you know, restorative. So, you know, I do hope that people as they feel so kind of under siege by this world that, that we're living in now, that we think about Maybe I should slow down. Maybe I should sleep in today. Maybe I don't need to an answer to every email in my inbox today. So just recently, as a good example, I put an auto reply in my emails because I've been just getting way up to too many ridiculous requests. And I do want to slow things down. And I want to let people know, like, I'm not going to answer your email within a day, so just buzz off, you know? And that's my attempt at setting boundaries to also slowing down. Part of it is telling people, I am slowing down, and you're just going to have to deal with it. But also just to give it myself the permission to slow down. So. I do hope everybody says that. I think, you know, it is what we think of as the modern world, which is going way too fast. Cool. I, I agree. Um, so I'm going to merge together two, I think, related questions. So, uh, Ruzbe, and I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, um, describes that they're a queer ex-psychiatry resident um, who is now an artist researcher and has been dealing with debilitating bouts of chronic fatigue syndromes. And they've been thinking a great deal about people suffering from uh, undiagnosed and contested medical conditions and how they live in a, you know, invisible space. And um, they, they say, you know, it's, I know it's an important situation complex situation, but I wonder with your background in medical sociology, if you had any thoughts on the intersection between disability and these undiagnosed or, un or contested medical illnesses. And that leads really nicely and I think is also related to an anonymous question that says that, you know, they identify as disabled, but they don't have a diagnosis and wonder if you have mm -hmm. any advice for navigating an ableist world that expects you to have a badge in order to self-advocate effectively. Yeah, I know this is a, this is the really sucky thing about the medical industrial complex, right? This is something we are entangled in. You know, that medical ableism and racism is definitely a thing and uh, it's really hard to, we're in this system whether do we want to or not, and it's a real struggle. And I think, uh, you know, there are such, I think, uh, a growing movement by people with invisible and undocumented disabilities to really push it back in terms of patient advocacy or any sort of healthcare advocacy to whether you identify as a patient or not. But really pushing back against the way healthcare is organized, the way the medical profession treats people, which as we know, you know, is just still horrific. I think the fact that people just aren't believed to begin with is the problem that, you know, we, if we don't hit certain markers and we don't have the money to, to pay for testing, if we don't even have insurance, you know, countries that don't have universal health care, I mean, people don't have insurance so that they, they clearly don't have access to care. You know, these are all things that really hurt so many people. I think for me, what I've learned from other people who don't have a diagnosis yet, that don't have, you know, a clear to fight, you know, uh, 
disability, um, due to the fact that they're not alone, and that there are so many communities now that have been created and really, you know, a source of mobilization and, you know, organizing that's really extraordinary. Like, this is what's going to change the system. Uh, I do believe that there is, yes, so this is, I think, a matter of what you all are talking about, health, health justice. Just so, you know, not only is this about social justice, disability justice, but I really recommend uh, for some of you who are interested in this, an organization called Health, Just Health Justice Commons. And their website is healthjusticecommons.org. And they are an amazing group that does such like, workshops on addressing, on dealing with gaslighting, on dealing with the medical industrial complex, whether you have the diagnosis or not, because we know that's part of the problem. So I really recommend that, you know, if anybody's looking for more education, information, community, to check out health justice comments. So that would be kind of my suggestion, but I do feel like, you know, at this time, there are even, there's so many more people to really, you know, demanding accountability and structural change from the medical establishment. And I'm really excited to see this. And I think this is a, also coinciding with the more doctors disclosing and identifying as disabled people, which I think is also something that's really lovely to see. I think it's also worth discussing, which lots of people have, is how, you know, what are the demographics of the people who are um, dealing with not having a diagnosis or a contested illness because overwhelmingly it is women and people of color who are not being believed by the medical establishment and there's you know huge issues medical sexism and medical racism mm -hmm. that are tied into who gets a diagnosis and who does not and that that needs to yeah, I think that that's also important, like knowing, you know, someone who myself has struggled with getting a diagnosis, as many women do, knowing that it's not just you, like it, it's your, it's part of a larger phenomenon, at least for me, was a relieving thing of just like, mm -hmm. oh, it's not all on me. I'm not a failure. It's, you know, sexism is working against me very strongly at the moment. Yeah, and I think one example of, you know, one um, group that's been particularly vocal is people with ME, CFS. So that's also known as myalgic encephalomyelitis, commonly known as chronic fatigue syndrome. And people have just, I mean, really built a movement from their bedrooms, from their couches really take it to task the way this um, this the disability is diagnosed and the kind of prescribed care and interventions and a lot of research. So, you know, one organization or one documentary that I think is really wonderful is by Jed Brea. Unrest. Who, yes, Unrest which I think does a wonderful job to uh, highlight the very real impact of her search for diagnosis, of the real trauma and gaslighting she, she faced, but also the incredible, you know, community that she discovered. So, 
to one of the groups that is part of this, you know, rise of people with invisible diagnosed disabilities is called ME action. So this is mainly for people with ME CFS, but I think it's one example of uh, what we're seeing, what I've described. So ME action is at ME A-C-T-I-O-N dot net. And I believe, you know, there's probably a lot of other groups like that, but this is an example of people power. All right. Um, it is 8.30. Alex, uh, yeah. what, you know, well, can we go over time? What, what do you... We only have the captionist till 8.30, <laughs> technically, so, um, okay. yeah. Um, so maybe um, we can encourage people to continue this conversation in other spaces if, and maybe if you and Alice want to say some final words to wrap up. Um, and I just want to thank you both for this conversation and for everyone who has been participating. And I'm sorry we're not able to get to everyone's questions, but thank you for sending them. And people should reach out to me. I'm on Twitter at sfdirewolf. And uh, my contact info is on my website. But uh, thank you all for being here on an evening. Uh, here with me. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Alice, for joining and for everyone who you know took the time to participate, even if you were just listening and you know no questions uh, immediately came to mind. Um, there were some questions that we didn't get to about COVID, and I think that is something that I'd just like to leave you all with a, a reminder that COVID is a feminist issue, it's a disability issue, and it's something, you know, it's also a race issue, it's also a colonial issue, all the others, but I think, you know, one thing that I see is we especially in feminist spaces, I'm not seeing enough discussion of the intersection with disability because as we were just discussing, like women are more likely to be dealing with medical sexism, more likely to be dealing without a diagnosis, without getting workplace accommodations, um, you know, having all their health infrastructure totally, you know, get destroyed by lockdowns and all that. And um, yeah, I, I see a lot of discussion of like, oh, women are hurt, hurt by the pandemic because of parenting, but I, you know, just as some final thoughts, no, it's much more complicated than that. Like everything intersects and disability is, and always in my mind will be a feminist issue. So mm -hmm. thank you to Alex Ketchum and, you know, everyone else organizing this as part of the IGSF speaker series. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you so much. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Alex. Thank you so much. Um, everyone check out Alice's book and uh, continue to come to other events in our speaker series. They're all free, professionally captioned, and open to the public. So thank you so much. Have a good evening. Bye. 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 Thank you all. Thank you.